Tejan mentioned, we have different schedulers uh, implemented in different ways. Uh, uh, some of them are like pure BPF schedulers. Others are hybrid schedulers, meaning that they have the BPF part and a user space part. And other schedulers are full user space. Well, just a couple of them right now. And so in this presentation, if I can figure out how to change slides, OK. So basically, I started, uh, at some point, I decided to uh, implement a, a scheduler using Rust uh, in user space and use BPF to channel, to basically intercept uh, the SCADEX event and channel all of them to user space. Uh, we were very skeptical but at the beginning, even with Tejun, we were like, this is just a fun project, it's going to be a toy. Uh, probably still is, but um, it's, the, the thing is like, the uh, it, it, it was the, the potential was interesting because like once you're in user space, you have the flexibility to use, you know, any kind of user space libraries and also in terms of observability, you see the scheduler as like regular user space process in Linux. You can either even top and see how much CPU the scheduler itself is using. Um, so yeah, I, I decided to, to keep going and, and continue to work on this project. And at some point, uh, I was like, well, let's generalize this and extract the lower, the back end of this scheduler and make it generic so that other people can easily use that to build other user space schedulers on top. So that's why I created this SCX Rustlin core. It's a Rust crate or Rust library, if you want to see like that that implements the abstraction layer over SCADEX. Um, it's basically an interface between the, the, the SCADEX and, and the user space. Um, and using, so with SCX Rustlin Core, it's a crate. You can import the crate in your project. You can create a standalone Rust project like any Rust project, you know, cargo init and, and whatnot, cargo build and run. Uh, it's a GPL v2, so you, your schedulers need to be GPL v2 as well if you use this. Um, and uh, yeah, the, as I mentioned, like the, the, the main goals for this project are the, the better user space integration. With, I say libraries, but also services, because once you're in user space, potentially, you can communicate with other things easily. Uh, Tejun mentioned the fast edit compile test iteration as a benefit of SCADEX in general. Uh, if, I mean, if you're in user space, even more, like you can literally, well, e even the BPF schedulers, you can dot slash and control C to, to ch change the scheduler, do, do modifications and whatnot. Uh, but user space, even more. Um, yeah, so here's the architecture. Basically, there is, and you see the point? The, 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 yeah, maybe. So let me go here. So there's the kernel part, that's the SCADEX in kernel patch. Uh, usually what you do, you implement your scheduler here in BPF, uh, implementing the callbacks. Use, use the, uh, oh, I need to use the, you're right, good point. <laughs> so that's the kernel part, I hope you can see. That's the, this is the BPF part. I mean, it's, I, I can be more descriptive. On the left, you can see the kernel part. <laughs> On the center, you will see the BPF part. When you implement a scheduler in BPF, usually you implement the callbacks in BPF, like in queue dispatch and whatnot. And everything sits here in the BPF space. Or you can have something in the right side that uses the user space part, like uh, SCX Rusty, for example, that implements the load balancer in user space. But most of the decisions are done and implemented in the central part with the callbacks. With Rustland, what happens instead is that this layer for the SCX callbacks is really small. It just implements a kind of message passing interface to user space, whereas any task that wants to run, uh, it just bounds to the user space part. User space takes all the decision, like 100% of the decisions, and sends everything back to BPF. Uh, so it's Rust, 
but it's not Rust for Linux. It's a different, it's a, I'm cheating. It, I'm bringing Rust into the kernel, but from user space, actually. Moreover, I'm not generating BPF code from Rust. I'm generating binary code in user space, and there's still a, a C component implemented in here that is like the connection between the two words. That's how it works. I'm not going through the details of the uh, workflow, but you can uh, already describe everything. The only thing that I want to mention is that at some point we switch to use the BPF map type ring buff and user ring buff. When we switch to that, uh, we got a massive boost in performance because before we were using maps, uh, 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 queues that are using syscalls. So every time that a task was moved, uh, bounced between user space and kernel, there was a syscall. Now everything is just copy. Uh, I mean, you, you share from user space, you share the address space with BPF. So you just copy stuff into the ring buffers, and it's really fast. And another thing that I want to mention is, uh, so when I, when, I, when I say like schedule and user space, uh, one of the concerns is like, yeah, but hover it is going to be a lot if you move to user space. It, it, it's not actually the case um, for many reasons. One of them is the scheduler is not a CPU intensive task on its own because usually the scheduler doesn't do anything except uh, for short bursts when you need to take a scheduling decision, take the scheduling decision, and then it's most of the time is the user space process or the kernel process that are just going. Uh, that's why, like, you ha if, you ha if your scheduler is using too much CPU, then there's a problem in the scheduler. I mean, you have a design problem, probably. And the other reason is that you need to be fast at reacting when the scheduler needs to take a decision. And if you can achieve that, you don't have much over it for doing that. So, in yeah, in this my, my, my session, I wanted to focus on the API, and, and I'm happy to accept suggestions or uh, yeah, if you have any comments to do. The, the goal was to make the API as easy as possible so that literally everyone could just use the Rust crate, implement, uh, uh, and, and use, the, like, this is really simple, right? You, you have a BPF scheduler, you declare a BPF scheduler object, and you have the queue task, uh, that gives you a task that wants to run. You can call select CPU that will use a built-in uh, policy to select an idle CPU and dispatch task when you like, okay, I'm done my scheduling, just send this over and uh, the, the kernel will, will actually run the task on the target CPU selected for the amount of time. Um, and there is a notification to say, okay, I've done my, all my scheduling just BPF, just do your work and dispatch everything. Um, okay, yeah, the data types you can. So, okay, it's not all uh, rainbows and unicorns. There are there are caveats to that. Um, in particular, like if you ha if your scheduler is in user space, uh, the scheduler can't be blocked. If it's if it's blocked, uh, everything it stalls, of course. And uh, in particular, page faults. Like if you're, uh, let's say, your user space scheduler triggers a page fault, in order to resolve the page fault, you need to run a K thread. But if the K thread can't run because the scheduler is blocked on the page fault, uh, you have that block. So uh, we solve this by creating a, a memory arena that is M locked and pre-allocated so that, uh, and it's done, it's all done, trans done transparently in Rust. Uh, so this part is mostly addressed. There are some corner cases, like one of them is the K compact D. So K, even if you M lock memory, that's, that's something I didn't know, like even if you M lock some memory, K compact D can, can still unmap something to do compaction. And that's bad for the user space scheduler because it can trigger page faults. Um, another thing, it, uh, so multi-threading was tricky, but it's currently solved. So you can have multiple threads running in your, in your user space schedulers. Um, like, 
yeah, there's again over it is one of the uh, one of the issues, but. It's the overhead is not about the communication. It's more about the user space not having all the visibility that you have in the kernel. In particular, and like the the, the, SCADEX, the other SCADEX people knows this uh, very well, is the visibility of CPU masks. Uh, if we can figure out a way to share the CPU masks, uh, like the idle mask, uh, idle SMT masks, and and whatnot. Uh, in user space, and if we have a way to create CPU masks, uh, I think we can really achieve performance identical to pure BPF schedulers. Uh, because like, even right now, with the latest few changes that I pushed, uh, like the FIFO scheduler in BPF achieves the, exactly the same performance of the FIFO scheduler in user space. That's, Im uh, that's impressive, considering that we started with like, oh, that's gonna be a toy, that's it. Uh, so the, the kernel visibility is really what we should focus on if we want to uh, improve this project. Uh, potentially, like my, my idea is, except for standardizing the user space APIs, because of course it's important, but I want to introduce the, uh, reuse the, the concept of scheduling domains, uh, probably from Rusty could be a good idea, uh, but, but have a way so that uh, the like to, to create uh, CPU masks from user space. And for those that are familiar with BPF, uh, it would be nice to use like the test run uh, in the BPF uh, functionality so that you can call BPF functions from user space. And in this way, like you can create a domain as a CPU mask, maybe assign an ID, and then uh, when you call this guy here, select CPU, you can say instead of using select CPU system wide, maybe you can attach, like you can ask a CPU in a certain domain. That should give, uh, that should give more uh, control on what you can do from user space. And once we have that, I think, in terms of performance, we can, we can achieve uh, really good performance, even if we are in user space. Uh, yeah, let's see what time is it. I, I would like to, I don't know how much I spent, but I would like to have time for questions. If there are, there's any question, especially if you have suggestions on the API that you would like to see for this stuff. There. Is there some measurement of the overhead that you mentioned? I, yeah, I have some slides, not in this presentation, <laughs> in another one that, that will be on Friday. Uh, but the overhead is like, uh, I need to redo all the measurements because I just pushed a, a change like on Monday <laughs> uh, that improves things a lot. Uh, the last measurements that, I, that I've done, uh, running the uh, selection of benchmarks from the four Onyx benchmarks, uh, I picked the, the benchmarks that the cache OS is, is usually running. They're mostly, uh, so that they're not interactive benchmarks, they're more server workload benchmarks. And I tried like to uh, run Rustland with those benchmarks and EVDF, same benchmarks. Like the difference was like three, five percent. Uh, Rustland was lower three, five percent. Uh, and it's kind of surprising because Rustland is designed to be like to prioritize a lot of interactive workloads. So I was expecting if I run server workloads that don't that are not like uh, I mean you don't get many benefits if you over prioritize interaction. Uh, but still, I mean I was a, was pretty close to um, to EVDF, and, but but that was a good test because I could like the scheduler was not stressed too much, so I could really measure the overhead, like the pure overhead of the layer. So I would say around 5%. It's, it's still a lot, uh, but not, not, too, not too bad. <laughs> and it should be improved, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Perfect. yeah, about the, uh, the M-lock issue, I was wondering, like, can that be fixed by maybe uh, moving the uh, the scheduling uh, logic for uh, the uh, K threads to BPF and 
just having the rest in user space so that way it won't you can take page faults yes that's yeah that's a valid point that was the first uh, uh fix that i that i did uh, I, I decided, okay, let's just ignore the K-threads, uh, just dispatch them in, from BPF directly and send everything everything else to user space. It, it, it's possible. There, at some point, there was even a flag, like a global flag that was called co local K-threads that you could set to like enable this, this mode. Uh, the problem is we, you may have big K-threads -thread, K that are doing a lot of CPUs. Let's say you have, a I don't know, an encrypted file system and uh, you're doing a ton of writes and some, you may have a key thread that is monopolizing the CPU. So you also may want to control that. Uh, so yeah, th this option doesn't exist anymore. I decided to, to remove that option to dispatch key threads from, uh, uh, from BPF. What I'm doing though, I'm still dispatching per CPU key threads from BPF, but that's because of the RCU uh, the, the per C, R, RCU slash uh, N uh, K threads, and if you, because if you block them, it it's tricky. You may have, you may still have deadlocks. So that those are the only K threads that are dispatched directly from BPF now. Yeah, yeah I guess you could. Ha the first fix could be an option as well. Even though you remote it, maybe some people might prefer that, and then not have to do the M lock. Yeah, that's good. It's a good. Yeah, that's what I. That's the question that I wanted to API, what kind of API would, would, you, li would, you, get, would you guys like to see? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, so you mentioned that like, it would be nice to have a CPU mask where instead of assigning specific CPU you ask it to be assigned some CPU in the mask. And it seems quite similar to what the device driver are doing for interrupt because they could also ask uh, the, the interrupt for the device to be assigned to uh, the same Numano, I guess. So I suppose we could kind of reuse, I, I'm not sure, but reuse the interrupt API and maybe have a KFunk in the kernel or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'm, I'm not familiar with how the CPU, the drivers are using the CPU mask for that, but, uh, it's so one of the things like that I want to provide is like a way that user space can create the CPU masks. Then how they are implemented, it's irrelevant because in the back end I can do whatever I want. And uh, so for, in terms of API, I think like using the function call from user space to BPF is, is a good way because I can say, you know, create a CPU mask with these, 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 these CPUs set, instead of passing the whole CPU mask, uh, I can have like a function call where I can say, enable this CPU in this domain. And that would reflect the change into a backend CPU mask that is allocated, for example, when a, when a domain is created or stuff like that. Uh, and then on the backend, it will be like a CPU mask. And, and I can use like, select CPU in the CPU mask domain or stuff like that. So just, just making sure I got it right. So you're saying that the, like passing the whole CPU mass is kind of like um, high overhead? Uh, or no, it's not, it's not like an overhead. It's like, um, how, how do you give visibility to, for, the, for the CPU mask to user space? That's the problem because it, it I mean, if it's small, uh, you can just, you know, reference the CPU mask from user space, and that's it. But if you have many CPUs, the CPU mask can grow a lot. Uh, and so how do you map that? How do you share that with user space? You can have a buffer, but if you copy the CPU mask to a buffer, it becomes racy and not reliable at all. So that's the problem. Thank you. Yes, uh, Igor. Uh, about the last question, I was thinking, uh, could you have a dedicated uh, VSDO? A, a dedicated what? Uh, VSDO, I never remember if it's VSDO or VDSO, but uh, basically a uh, read-only object shared by the kernel to user space. Uh-huh. So you mean with the CPU mask? Eh? 
Yeah, so basically you're going to have this uh, uh, uh-huh. well, one, yeah, one way. It's, I mean, it, it, technically it's read-write because I may want to be able to set certain bits from user space as well. Uh, from user space, uh, you can send the signal, say, hey, set that bit. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you can read the whole uh, mm-hmm. mask uh, from the kernel. It's, yeah, like, uh, so I'm thinking of CPU masks to mark the idle CPUs. So it's read-write uh, from user space because you can say isolate just these CPUs, uh, but it's read-write also on the back end because once once a CPU is allocated, let's say, it becomes non-idle. So yeah, I was just wondering if you had to use the same method to write them from user space or if you could... Ah. Uh, no, one, I mean, the... the do, one thing can happen in the back end when you set the CPU idle or non-idle. And another thing is to say, okay, enable this uh, pool of CPUs. And it's, it can be different. I mean, it, it can be the same. No, it's, it's, it's different. One is, uh, I mean, ultimately you still set and clear bits in a, in a CPU mask, but it should be a different interface. I have a more fundamental question. Why do you need to set the mask from user space? Can you schedule a sleep task and that's going to automatically take care of it? Yeah, the, the idea is to give user space the possibility to say, I want to create a domain with CPU 1 and CPU 3 and another domain with CPU 2 and CPU 4. So instead of saying, uh, when I was showing this, um, this API, the select CPU, instead of saying select CPU, give me a CPU across the, all the CPUs available, I want to say, give me a CPU in this domain. That's why so I want Are we to... still talking about CPU idle masks, or are you just talking about something else now? Yeah, it's, it's CPU idle mask, okay. but I also want to create, like, I want to put the idle mask in end with a custom CPU mask, so that I can restrict the domain of idle CPUs, if it makes sense. No, no. but okay. okay. <laughs> Let's say I have, so you have an idle mask with all the CPUs. I don't want an, any CPU in the idle mask. I want any CPU in that idle mask put in end with a custom idle mask so that I can say I want an idle CPU in the range uh, 0, 04, for example. That's why I need to create CPU masks from user space. Okay. Because I need the end uh, CPU mask. Okay. Um, I think I'm missing some details, but I want all the background stuff running uh, outside, I guess, not in user space, always like conflict with uh, anything that you do in user space, unless, I don't know, if you configure like isolated CPUs from the boot, or how do you actually isolate, your, let's say, your domains that you think you'll need in user space? Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, it, it depends what kind of isolation you want. If you want like strict isolation, uh, uh, this is this is more like uh, create a domain so that you can preferably allocate CPUs on that domain. And if you, you don't really care that much if anything else is running there when your user space task is running there. Yeah, well. right, right now that's the, the the way that I was okay. envisioning okay, this. Okay. But we can extend to provide like real isolation. Maybe in that case this is not the right way, but. Any other questions? Agat. Thank you. Um, in your API, why do you re- return I32s at some points and error at another point? I guess this is an, should, could be an enum or something with proper uh, error codes. W- which one, Agat? Uh, the errors in your results are I32. Uh, this this one like uh, on top. CPU. Oh, this one. Yeah, it's a result, but with I32, I would have expected an error or an enum maybe to make things more sensible. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. So, oh yeah, that, so that's the I32 is the error that you get uh, from the ring buffer API. So it's, lib, it's a libbpf error. So it, it shouldn't be an I32. It should be a libbpf uh, error. RS error. Yes. Yes. That you could. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good point. Thanks. Okay. No more questions. We are over time uh, a lot. Uh, next one. <laughs> Thanks.